Now let's discuss the sewage treatment unit. The sewage treatment plant has four main compartments. The primary chamber, the aeration, the settling arrangement, and the chlorination chamber. Let's start with the primary chamber. The primary chamber serves as the first point of contact for raw sewage entering the treatment plant. Most of the ships install a macerator, which breaks down the sewage into smaller particles. A bypass valve is a practical design consideration because the macerator pump to be bypassed for maintenance without interrupting the overall operation of the sewage treatment plant. The design of the primary chamber, aided by baffle plates, encourages the settling of heavier solids at the bottom and a breakdown of solid waste. This separation is crucial for the efficiency of the entire treatment process, as it prevents the overloading of the aeration chamber with solid waste. Retreated sewage, now with reduced solid content, is then transferred to the aeration chamber. In this compartment of the treatment unit, aerobic bacteria, that is those bodies requiring dissolved oxygen to exist, reduce the influent waste material, which mainly comprises carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and sulfur, into carbon dioxide water and new bacteria cells. The carbon dioxide is emitted throughout the vent system, whilst the water, together with the bacteria cells, are displaced into the settling compartment. Air is supplied to the sewage from a rotary compressor through a number of fine bubble diffusers located at the bottom of the tank, but removable from the side for ease of maintenance. The air provides the life-giving oxygen to the aerobic organisms and also keeps the contents of the tank intimately mixed with the incoming raw sewage and the returned, settled, activated sludge. After aeration, the water moves to the settling compartment, where the heavier bacteria, sludge, settle at the bottom. The design is a hopper type, which means it has sloping sides to ensure that sludge doesn't accumulate, but instead is directed towards the airlift tube. This tube takes sludge from the bottom of the settling compartment and returns it to the aeration compartment. It plays a critical role in recirculating active sludge back into the system to maintain a high concentration of bacteria for treating incoming wastewater. A visual indicator allows operators to visually check the sludge return, ensuring the process is operating correctly. The surface skimmer is a device is used to remove any floating debris or scum from the water surface. Similar to the first, this airlift is specifically used to return the skimmed debris back to the aeration tank for further processing, ensuring a clean effluent discharge. After primary treatment processes in the aeration and settling chamber, the effluent is further treated using chlorine for disinfection. Some ships use chlorine tablets or diluted chlorine liquid, which are dissolved at a controlled rate, releasing chlorine when they come into contact with water. The chlorinator is designed as a flow-through system. All of the effluent passes over the chlorine chamber, ensuring that every part of the flow absorbs the required amount of chlorine. This direct contact method is efficient in achieving uniform disinfection throughout the volume of effluent. The outlet end of the chlorinator, there's a control weir designed to adjust to the effluent flow rate. As the flow increases, the water level within the chlorinator rises, bringing more of the effluent into contact with the chlorine. This design ensures that the amount of chlorine released into the effluent automatically adjusts to the flow rate, maintaining sufficient chlorine levels for sterilization regardless of variations in the effluent volume. Inside the chlorination tank, there are level alarms. These alarms alert if the water level gets too high, indicating maybe the water isn't leaving the tank as fast as it should. Then there's another alarm for when the level gets too low, which could mean there's not enough effluent coming in. Now, connected to this system, there's a level switch. It's connected to the discharge pump and automatically set the pump when to start working and when to stop based on the water level in the tank. There is also a redundancy standby pump in case the other pump requires maintenance. Discharging the treated water takes a carefully controlled process. There are strict rules outlined in Annex 4 of the sewage discharge criteria that set the where, 
when and how to discharge sewage. Generally, the vessel needs to be at least 3 to 12 nautical miles from the nearest shore and moving at a moderate pace, around 4 knots, to ensure the treated effluent disperses properly without harming marine life or water quality. And for times when discharge isn't possible or practical, the effluent can be stored to the sewage holding tank, which can be discharged on a later schedule. Based on our previous discussions of wastewater management, we've differentiated between two main types of wastewater, black water and gray water. Black water is the more contaminated type, coming from toilets, urinals, hospital waste units, and scuppers, as well as drainage from cargo holds that transport live animals. On the other hand, gray water, comprising drainage from dishwashers, cabin showers, laundry, and air conditioner condensates. Unlike black water, gray water bypasses the primary treatment chamber and is directed straight to the chlorination chamber. To facilitate regular maintenance, drain valves are installed within the system. These valves allow for the draining and cleaning of the treatment chambers, preventing the accumulation of sediments or blockages that could impair the system's efficiency. Additionally, a connection to seawater is integrated into the system. This connection is crucial for the dilution process in some treatment scenarios. The importance of the sewage treatment operation in maritime and coastal applications cannot be overstated. By treating wastewater before discharge, harmful contaminants are significantly reduced, thereby protecting marine life and maintaining the biodiversity of aquatic ecosystems, ensuring compliance with international regulations.